welcome to um, our visitors as well, if you're visiting with us. It is, it's Communion Sunday, and in preparation to receive the bread and drink from the cup with a discerning heart and mind, I want to share a reading that teaches us uh, about our posture, about our attitude, about our minds, about our thought when we come to the table to break bread and drink from the cup. We're in the New Testament today. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll begin at verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll read through verses 20 to 30. The New International Version reads like this. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. For the time that is ours to share, I want to speak with you on the topic this morning. Remember this. Remember this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And today, oh Lord, we take time out to ponder, to think, to reflect about what this really means for the body of Christ. We pray, O oh God, that you will speak to our hearts and speak to our minds. Convict us in the places where we need to be convicted. Remind us in the places where we need to remember. Bless us in the places where we are losing hope. And strengthen us in the areas where we are weak. Lord, in humility and in love, we submit ourselves before you, and we ask that you have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember this. I look like my mommy. If you were to see my mom, and you were to see me, you would say, you look just like your mom. And when people say that to me, I often say, yeah, she's pretty, right? Because you can tell by me. And, and they would just laugh. But, but me looking like my mom is just the, the way in which uh, people identify that I am um, Mrs. Brown's child. And, and the rest of my, my siblings, they look like my dad. And people say, you guys look just like your dad. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm adopted. Maybe I'm only half of their siblings. But they say, now nah, you all look alike. And if you see all of us together, you say, man, people identify us as brown children. They say, those are brown children right there. Because we look like our parents, but we identify with them. And I'm sure that it is the same with you in your own families as well. People identify with each other. 
And it made me think about the church. When we think about all of the different religious groups, there they are some distinguishing feature that identifies them together. Muslims, you can identify that they are Muslim based on what they dress and that they, they, they always seem to be in prayer. The Hindus, we can identify them as well. And everybody know who is a Jehovah Witness come Saturday morning, amen? Yes, we do, we identify people. And it made me think about the church, Christians, the body of Christ. What identifies us as Christians, as Christ followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ? And you may say that, well, we read the Bible. But well, that's not true because people who are not Christians even read the Bible and know the Bible, all right? Or you may say, well, we speak in tongues, but all of us don't speak in tongues either. And so you want to ask the question, what connects us as believers? What says to us that we are Christian, that we are in the body of Christ? And the one thing I thought about, well, one of the things that is so important, and one of them, it's a big thing, it's communion. It is breaking bread and drinking of the cup. No other faith religion does this. It is unique to Christianity. The Lord's Supper is what unites us and it identifies us that we have a savior who has sacrificed himself, who died on the cross of Calvary so that we can have the gift of eternal life and by his blood we are redeemed communion it unites us it identifies us as people who are part of the body of christ and the same way in which communion identifies us we we also have those areas in which it divides us as well there are differences in how we come to the lord's table and one way is by the name so it is referred to as the Lord's Supper. And that is because the Lord Jesus Christ himself instituted it, so it becomes the Lord's Supper. And then another name is Holy Communion, because when we come together in this space to share at the Lord's table, it is holy. It is a sacred space. It is a sacred time. And when I was a child growing up, you, you couldn't even touch the, the communion table because it was so holy you, you couldn't put your purse there and you certainly couldn't sit on the communion table it was a holy space and the other name is eucharist and eucharist means thanks given we also differ in the frequency in which the different churches celebrate the lord's supper some people do it once a month like like we do here and then there are other churches who, who do it every single Sunday. Every time they gather together, they share in the Lord's Supper. And then you have other churches that they just do it once a year around um, the Lent season. We also differ in how we take it. Like for, for, like for us today, we have our own cup and we have our own individual bread. For some churches, there is just one cup and everybody will drink from that one cup <laughs> I, I don't know you all like that and i remember once i, I went to a church and it was an anglican church and they had one cup and i was like you must be joking and everybody would go up and they would take the sip and the priest he would you know he has his cloth and he would wipe and and my friend is nudging me through in a yacht and i'm like never I will not have that, but, but they have assured me that it's quite okay. I'm just not there as yet. And we also differ in that, in the bread. Some people have a loaf, like Deborah put a whole two loaves there. Some people will only have the unleavened bread. Then when we speak about the cup, you, you have this, we can have grape juice. Some people have grape juice, or some churches have watered down wine, but then some churches, they got the real deal, right? The real stuff, right? And all of it is good. We also differ in, in our theological terms, in what we refer to as uh, communion. So 
the Catholic Church, they believe in uh, transubstantiation, where they believe that the, the bread and the wine actually literally becomes the body, Jesus Christ. And then you have consubstantiation. Uh, that is, Lutherans believe in that, that while the bread and the cup does not literally become Christ Jesus, that he is in all of that. But for you and I, we, we believe in the term commemoration. We commemorate, we do it as commanded by Jesus, that we do it and we remember him. And when, when John comes and leads us today, John will be the celebrant because he's reminding us that we really ought to celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And this is the message that the Apostle Paul pressed upon the Corinthian church that I press upon you today, that there ought to be something that you and I remember when we come to the table, something that, that are important for us to remember, to to think on as the body of Christ. And the very first issue that the Apostle Paul dealt with was that he said to us, remember that we must care about each other. We must care for each other. When you think about the word communion, you're hearing community. That the Apostle Paul says when you come to the table, we do not come to entertain ourselves. We do not come to add to our resume. We do not come out of a monthly routine or a ritual, but rather when we come to the table, we are to be reminded that we are a community of believers that care for each other. Why does the Apostle Paul deal with this issue? Well, in the Corinthian church at that time, when they met for communion, it, it was in the context of a larger meal. And what you found was that the rich were in their own little cliques eating all of their wealthy food, and the poor were off by themselves being hungry. That the rich had the larger cuts of meat and the poor had the scraps. And there was a time I, I went to a communion from a church and they served communion like this where they had this large festive meal before and then after all of that there was communion. This was how it was done at that time. But the problem in the Corinthian church was that the Lord's Supper was being abused. The rich were stuffed and they were drunk and the poor were off by themselves with the, having scraps. They had watered down wine and they were still hungry even when they gathered together as the body of believers. And the Apostle Paul said to them, that is not communion. That is not what the Lord's table is all about. When I first came to this country, there was this, apparently you all play games with food. And, and I went to downtown kitchen and they were playing this game where they, the kids were asked to make parachute. And the way that you knew that your parachute was done well was that you put an egg inside and you would release it from a height and if your egg didn't break, then you know you had a good parachute. And I remember sitting there and I was like, man, are those real eggs? And, and somebody would say, yeah, and I'm like, it can't be. Because for me, it was like, how do you waste food like that? And the Apostle Paul was saying to the church, be mindful, be discerning about those who do not have enough when we are stuffing ourselves and when we are wasting food. And by their action, they showed that they were actually immature in their faith when they believed that they were strong Christians. The Apostle Paul says that is not how it is done. When we take communion, we are to be reminded that just as Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for us, we are called to sacrifice ourselves for others. Just as he loves us, we are called to love each other. Just as he died for us, we are called to give up of, of ourselves so that others can be satisfied, others can be filled and something is out of order. 
When any one of us comes here satisfied and filled and another seems to be struggling and we are not aware that all is not well with somebody in the body of Christ. And the reality is that we cannot come here and just shout and sing praises to God, but we still can come together to share what we have to ensure that everybody has enough. Because church at its best is when we recognize that the person who we sit beside, the person who are in the building with us is somebody who we ought to love, somebody who we ought to care about, and that we really should not leave here without saying to somebody, how are you? Is there any way in which I can bless you because I care about you? We cannot expect to live happy lives and not care for those who are suffering, not care for those who are hungry, not care for those who are homeless, because what God gives to us it is not just for us. God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing to others. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, what I receive from the Lord, that which I give to you. Because whatever it is that we are receiving from the Lord, whatever God is downloading inside of us, whatever God is blessing us with, the expectation is that we will be blessing others. If God loves me, I'm going to love you. If God hooks me up, I'm going to hook you up. If God is looking out for me, I'm going to look out for you. That the Lord's Supper celebrates that we are not just in a relationship with God, but that we are in a relationship with each other. And if we are serious about our walk with God, then we must remember that we are called to walk with one another. And that also takes the context of those who are sick among us, those who are shut in, those who cannot gather with us, that we are always remembering them. And when we visit them, we also take communion to them. And we share that with them because we are saying to them, I have not forgotten you. You are remembered, you are loved, and you are cared for. And this is something that we really ought to begin to take into consideration. When we visit those who are sick, when we visit those who are shut in, take communion and share that with them. To not care about each other. To have divisions, to have unrepentant sin and still take communion, still come to the Lord's table is to desecrate, it is to violate, and it is to treat with disrespect the Lord's Supper and what Christ did for us by dying on the cross. And so the Apostle Paul says, care for each other, care about the less fortunate. And then he goes on to say that, we need to remember number two, we are blessed even when we are being broken. That's the hard one. The term we use is not only communion, meaning in community, but another term is Eucharist, thanksgiving. The Bible says in verse 23 and 24 that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and before he broke the bread, he blessed it. He gave thanks. On the night Judas betrayed him, he gave thanks. On the very night he knew that Peter would deny him three times, he gave thanks. On the night he agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane, he gave thanks. Thanks. On the night that he knew he would suffer an unjust trial, he gave thanks. On the night he had to journey with the pain and the shame of the cross, he gave thanks. On the night when he knew that all hell was about to break loose in his life, Jesus took the time to give thanks. When it seemed that he had absolutely nothing to give God thanks for, he gave thanks. When he looked all the way down in history 
and he saw me and he saw you in our sinful ways, sinning over and over and over and over again, he stopped and he took time out to give thanks because Jesus knew without him being broken, you and I, we would never ever make it. He gave thanks. And this is a reminder that what identifies us as believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, is that we really ought to know how to give God thanks all the time in all situations. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and then he broke it. Before he himself was broken, he blessed us in spite of our own brokenness and in spite of our own sinfulness and in spite of whatever it is you may be facing today, Jesus gave God thanks for what his suffering was to accomplish because he knew that better was on the way. Better would come for each and every one of us. And so he said, Father, I give you thanks because he knew what he did would accomplish a blessing for you and I. In spite of the cruel way in which he had to suffer, he gave thanks, knowing that his suffering would take away our sins, our faults, our failures, our wickedness, our wretchedness. We are the benefactors of his suffering and his amazing grace, and we are called to give God thanks in all things. Jesus took the bread, and he blessed it, and then he broke it. Before it was even broken, it was blessed. And yeah, you must be breaking this morning, but you're still blessed. You may be hurting, but you are blessed. God has blessed us and we have every reason to be thankful for what God has done. You may be sick, but you are still blessed. You may be broken, but you are still blessed. You may be lonely, but you are still blessed. You may be having relationship issues, but you are still blessed. You may have financial problems, but you are still blessed. We are blessed. You may be unemployed, but you are still blessed. Because in spite of the breaking, in spite of what may be hurting us, we are still blessed. And we know that the best is yet to come if we would keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, giving him thanks for everything that he has done. One of my favorite hymns is, There is a fountain filled with blood. Because I used to be a little bit wretched, you know. And, and that song says, there is a fountain filled with blood, poured from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. And then the last verse says, ever since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die because it reminds me of how blessed I am. But in spite of everything, Jesus Christ still went to the cross and he died for you and me. We must always give God thanks because we are a blessed people. So we are to care about each other. We are to remember that we are blessed even when we are being broken. And finally, the Apostle Paul says, remember that our Redeemer will return. In verse 26, the Apostle Paul says, as often as you eat this bread, and as often as you drink this cup, we proclaim his death till he comes. And nobody proclaims death of those whom we love. And yet the word of God says to us, every time we meet to do this, proclaim his death until he comes. 
So when we partake in the Lord's Supper, it is not just a simple empty ritual, but it is our proclamation that the Lord, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, he died. And we proclaim that he died until he come. Jesus died for me and Jesus died for you. Jesus died for the world. He sacrificed himself because he was the only one who was qualified to do so. My favorite time of the year is, is Lent. It, it really is. And I would, I would sit down and I would put on the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And I would do the crying thing, you know. And my sister would always say, oh, Serena, stop killing Jesus every year. And, and, and she would say, and take the man off the cross. And I would say, I know that, I know, but I'm, I'm always humbled by what he did for me. It always gives me joy that somebody could die so that I can have the free gift of eternal life. He loves me. He loves me. And that is something that you can say for yourself. He loves me so much. I am so loved. And we really ought to be happy about the cross because it tells our story of forgiveness. It tells our story of our freedom. It tells the story of our redemption. And it tells the story of our salvation. So I proclaim, I proclaim it that Jesus died. He died. He died for me and he died for you so that we can receive eternal life. And the Apostle Paul says, proclaim it. Proclaim it. And the Bible tells us that Jesus stayed in the, cross, in the grave Friday night. And come Saturday morning, he was still in the grave. Saturday afternoon, he was still in the grave. Saturday evening, he was still in the grave. And the Bible says, early one Sunday morning, he rose with all power in his hand. That is something we ought to proclaim. He did that for you and I. He did it. He rose. We have a resurrected Savior. And the Bible says, proclaim it because Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered death. I believe it. I declare it. I shout it. Jesus conquered death. Our sins are forgiven. We are blood-washed children of God. Free. Completely free from the bondage of sin. Glory be to God. And that is a hallelujah praise right there. He conquered death. He rose but the Bible says something interesting that we don't get to stay there. There is good news. There is better news coming. The Bible says that one day the clouds will be rolled back. And the Lord himself will descend. And those that are dead in Christ shall be risen up to meet him. And we who remain, we will also rise to meet him. And we will be with him together forevermore, forevermore we serve a reigning, redeeming, soon returning King, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is coming back. He will return. And because he's coming back, because he will return, we can have hope in the darkest of times. That whatever is hurting you, God has given us the blessed assurance that one day he will return. So we proclaim his death till he comes. And I thought to myself, what does till he comes mean? Till he comes mean that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Till he comes mean that weeping may endure for the night, but joy will come in the morning. Till he comes mean that we have hope, and our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name when he shall come with trumpet sound. 
Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed not in my own unrighteousness, but in his righteousness. And the Bible says, faultless we will stand before his throne on Christ, the solid rock we can stand. Remember this. When I look at this text, two things always struck me. And the first one is in verse 27 where it says, whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning against the blood and body of our Lord. And then verse 30 says, that is why many among you are weak and sick and some have died. That the Lord is serious about his table. That God expects us to hold ourselves in certain ways. And that just as he chastised the Corinthian church and punished them, he will do the same to us. The Lord's table is an opportunity for spiritual growth and blessings. But only if we approach it with the right attitude and in the correct way. When we come to the table, we must come with an awareness that we must care for each other. We must come remembering that we are blessed even when we are being broken. And we must come remembering that our Redeemer will return. That is what we are called to remember when we come to the table. And that is the call to the table this morning. The Bible says, don't come unworthily. Don't come with unrepentant sins. Don't come undiscerning. Don't come in ignorance. Do not come in routine and ritual. Do not come to the table callously. But when we come to the Lord's table, we must come with a deep appreciation, knowing the worth and knowing the weight of what taking the bread and drinking from the cup means. Let us always remember this. We should know what we are doing. And we should know why we are doing it. Because that is part of what identifies us as the body of Christ. And as Joy comes to lead us in a worship song, I want us to take the time that we need to, to think. Consider our own lives. Discern what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. If we have sins we need to repent from, the altar is open. If they are saying, if we have fault with somebody, the, Jesus Christ says, do not come to the table if you have issues with somebody else, but rather go and deal with it. Can you imagine? We may be here all day if we had to really be obedient to what Jesus has said. And so as joy praise. I want us to, you can either come to the altar or you consider what it is you need to say to Jesus. What do we need to, who do we need to forgive? What do we need to repent from? Is there anyone that we are in that we, we need to forgive? Let us take the time out so that we are not eating and drinking on work and being guilty of offending the Lord's table.